Hi everyone. At the end of part two, I had this Spectrum up and running, albeit with its upper memory removed. You may recall that I had tested the upper memory and found three of the eight chips faulty as per the RAM test results. Now this puzzled me slightly, and after recording, I refitted all the memory chips and it worked absolutely fine. I completed some RAM tests just to make sure that the full 48K was working and well, it was. So why would the RAM tester report faulty ICs and yet they would work absolutely fine? Well, perhaps it's because that back in the day and to save a few quid, Sinclair purchased 64K RAM chips that didn't pass their initial tests. These were tested again as 32K chips and labeled as such to show which segment worked, either the lower or the upper half of the ICs. Sinclair made use of these cheaper components and allowed the Spectrum to be configured via jumpers to use either half of the chip. So although our 64K chips may not be fully working, my Spectrum is configured to only use the lower half of the memory chips. You can tell this by the label on these Texas Instruments 4532 chips with the NL3 suffix, denoting that the lower half is good. Incidentally, if the chip had an NL4 suffix, then that would indicate that the upper half is good. Now, if we did have an issue with these chips, we could logically follow a series of tests to work out which IC was not fully operational. And a great YouTube channel that describes how to do this and diagnose simple faults on memory chips is Happy Little Diodes. Not only does Jim complete some upgrades on various spectrums, but also explains how to diagnose and find faults in common issues. I've put a link in the description below, so please share the love and subscribe to his channel. Anyway, with this ZX Spectrum fully operational, I've played some games, completed some memory tests, and all is well. Even the keyboard seems to work correctly too, so we won't be replacing the membrane on this one. We are instead going to carry out some proactive maintenance on this issue 2 board and replace the electrolytic capacitors. Like batteries, ancient electrolytic capacitors are bad news for old electronics. They can either dry up, or worse still, ooze their contents across the board and cause huge amounts of corrosion to the PCB. Thankfully, modern replacement capacitors are available online as complete sets, and I got mine from Retro Revival on eBay. I'll put a link down below. And like the originals, these are axle packages, so they will fit straight in. This job is fairly straightforward and can be completed in just an hour or so, so let's get started. I'm going to start with this capacitor, C46, which is labelled incorrectly on this Issue 2 board. As you can see, the silk screen shows the positive sign and the capacitor indicates which is the negative. And in this instance, the cap is correct, the PCB is well known to be wrong. Removing the capacitors can be done with either a solder braid, a solder sucker, or like me today, using a desoldering station. Once the solder is removed, remove the component and replace it. Now I tend to check the value of every component as I remove it. Older devices sometimes have surprises in store for us, so take nothing for granted. Now it's just a case of repeating until all the caps have been changed over. However, we do have one modification to deal with. Up in the top corner, this capacitor has been added onto C34. This being a radial 4.7 microfarad capacitor added as a service modification. The one I have to replace is an axial and not a radial. I just don't have any spares in my bin of bits. So first off, I'm going to replace the C34 with its 22 microfarad capacitor and then add on and bend around the 4.7 microfarad and tuck it in place. That's all done, and I'm sure you can see it's not too bad. Now onwards to replace the rest of the capacitors. However, I will quickly show you how to remove a component using the solder braid. Solder braid is basically plated copper that has a super high surface area, and when applied to molten solder, the braid will tend to wick away the solder away from the board and onto the braid itself. So to use solder braid, first wet the tip of the soldering iron with some fresh solder. This will increase the surface area and then apply the braid onto the component leg and then apply the tip of the iron. Once the heat is transmitted through, the solder will wick away and up into the braid, away from the PCB and the component leg. No matter your method of removing solder, it is important to remove as much solder as you possibly can, and then test the component is free by gently wiggling its pin. If it's not moving, it's still attached to the circuit board. And these older boards, it's likely that the solder can still be attached on the other side of the board. So use some heat on the component leg, and then gently pull the component out of the PCB. 
Once clear, use some desoldering braid to remove any last residue of solder. If this solder doesn't wick away easily, add some fresh solder and some flux to help the solder to flow. You will find that capillary action will allow the solder to flow quickly away once it's able to flow. Now I've replaced all but one of the capacitors and you'll find out why in the next video. But right now it's time to test. So I'm going to make sure there's no solder splashes, no component legs are left on the desk and I'm going to power on the circuit board. I'm adding a diagnostics cart onto the board and I'm just going to let it power on. And so far everything looks fine. Well it did for about an hour. I set it to soak memory test until a rather ominous error popped up stating that all the RAM chips had failed. On closer inspection there was one dry solder joint on the 100 microfarad capacitor. And one solder joint wasn't that great on C47. So after allowing the spectrum to cool and after reflowing the joints and testing the RAM, I fired it up again and all was well. So it should be noted that these capacitors really do need to have good connection on both the top and the bottom of the board. Without this, you can possibly have strange issues, just like I did. So I still have a couple of jobs I want to do on this spec heap before sending it off into the wild, including upgrading the video and doing something about the heat on this board. So until next time, many thanks for watching, take care, see you soon.